Thank you for joining. I'm Sherry from Sunflowers and Petals. Today we are talking with Iron Woman, elite paratriathlete and motivational speaker, Mary Kate Callahan. If you enjoy this video, be sure to hit the like button and also subscribe. So I wanna welcome Mary Kate, how are you tonight? I am good, how are you? Doing well. Good, good, happy so you, Thursday. Thank you, I'm ready for the weekend. Me too. Now, you're such an amazing athlete. When did you first discover your love for sport and competing? Oh, my gosh. So I say I've been an athlete since the day I was born. But as we all know, that's not really true. But um, at a young age, my parents got me involved in aqua therapy. Um, I had a virus at five and a half months old that left me paralyzed. And so, you know, went to physical therapy, occupational therapy. And uh, when I started aqua therapy, really just loved being in the water and um, you know, my parents saw that immediately. And, you know, when I was six years old, I came home from school and I told my parents I wanted to uh, join a swim team. And so that is when I think my career as being an athlete and I really found my identity as an athlete really began. Wow, that, that's a young age, but that's great. So back in 2012, when you were in high school, you sued the Illinois High School Association. Tell me what transpired there. Yes, yeah, so um, I went to Fenwick High School. I went to Fenwick High School, obviously, for the academic reasons, um, but also because I wanted to be uh, a student athlete. That was a really important part of my decision of going to Fenwick. And Fenwick has an amazing aquatic program. And, um, you know, when joined the swim team, was treated like any other athlete, you know, going to the double practices and, you know, going to swim all the dual meets and, you know, invitationals, but at a certain point in the season, athletes with disabilities were being cut off from being able to um, go to the sectional and state level uh, championship meets. And I knew that wasn't, that wasn't fair. And, right. um, you know, when I inquired about it, I was told by adults that people with disabilities aren't athletes, um, that we don't deserve the same opportunity. And, I knew I never wanted to hear those words again, but more importantly, I never wanted another child to have to hear those words again. And, um, you know, that's when I really found my, my voice and, um, you know, stood up against that. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have my parents support that and um, my high school support that. And we had the Illinois Attorney General support us as well. Um, and, you know, four years later in a deposition and, settlement conferences, we were able to settle in my senior year. Um, athletes with disabilities were able to try to qualify for this, uh, the state meet. And I remember, you know, looking to my left, looking to my right at the state meet and seeing these athletes that, you know, deserved to be there, that qualified to be there. And, you know, we weren't athletes with disabilities at that time. We were, you know, just high school student athletes. And, um, you know, now, since that happened, um, the number of athletes with disabilities in high school has doubled. Um, so that that number in itself is exactly why we went through what we went through. That that was fantastic. At, at such a young age to be able to do something like that, I commend you. Yeah. So yeah. swimming started it all for you. Um, how and when did you transition then to triathlons? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I, you know, I said, like I said, I, I swam, I started swimming at the age of six and, you know, swam through high school. Um, but, you know, during that period, I also tried every sport that was out there. You know, I played wheelchair basketball. I played wheelchair tennis. I was doing track. I was doing field. You know, I'd, go, I'd be water skiing and snow skiing. And, you know, I think that's the time in any child's life to just try any sport and not really focus on one single sport at um and you, you have the rest of your life to focus on one single sport. But, um, you know, when I was, when I was like 14, 15, um, Carrie Sirota, who we may talk about a little later, um, asked me if I wanted to do, tri do a triathlon. And I looked at her with these, these like big googly eyes and was like, what in the world do you mean? Um, and she's like, you're already a swimmer. You already are um, a biker. Like you, you, you're on your hand cycle all the time. And, um, you do track, so like you run, so let's just put them all together and do a triathlon. Right. And um, sure enough, she convinced me, and I crossed my first finish line. And 
was absolutely hooked. And, um, you know, the sport has done so much for me and has helped me grow into the person that I am and has introduced me to, com to a community that I'm so lucky to have in my life. And, um, you know, I've been able to travel the world doing something I love so much. So um, yeah. I'm forever grateful for it to be a, that I was introduced to the sport. Yeah, that I, I always tell people, do your first triathlon, you'll never stop. <laughs> you'll fall you'll never stop. <laughs> so in 2015, you set a course record um, at Ironman Louisville. You know, I can't even imagine the upper body strength that you need. Take me through your training routine. Yeah, so for those of you um, who don't know, I guess, how a para-athlete um, does a triathlon, um, so I can't, use, I can't use anything functionally below my weight, so I don't have really functional use of my legs, um, meaning when I do a triathlon, everything is with my upper body. So, um, you know, I swim with just my arms, my legs kind of just drag behind me, um, and then when it's time to bike, I bike on a hand cycle. Again, my legs are out in front, not doing any of the work and my arms are propelling me forward. And then on the run part, um, I'm in a racing chair. So some of you may have um, you know, seen some of the major marathons and you see um, these athletes in these racing chairs and that's what we utilize on the run because they have no gears where a hand cycle that we use on the bike does have gears. Um, so yeah, everything is with my upper bodies. I like to say my arms are the equivalent to any other athlete's legs. Um, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, training um, for Ironman, but really any distance triathlon for me, usually I'm doing two of the three disciplines a day. Um, but, you know, I think as I've gotten older, I've realized the importance of recovery um, and making sure, you know, I'm doing that recovery between sessions, making sure that my arms are as fresh as possible because, you know, when I'm not swimming, biking, or running, or doing strength workouts, I'm using my arms to propel my everyday wheelchair, and I'm using my arms to lift my wheelchair in and out of my car, so, you know, my poor arms really never get a break during the day, but, um, you know, I've been able to work with some phenomenal coaches and some phenomenal trainers and some phenomenal physical therapists just to, you know, make sure that um, I'm as healthy and as I'm, I'm as fit as I can be when I get to the start line. Now, do you add yoga or Pilates to your training program too? I do not. <laughs> uh, I've, done, I've done yoga a few times, not as consistently as I probably should. Um, everyone who I've gone to yoga with laughs because um, for those of you who don't know or might not be able to tell from this, I love to talk. I'm very loud. I have a hard time at being silent. <laughs> so yoga is very difficult for me for those reasons. Okay. Um, but it's, I do feel so great, but after I go, um, but I have resulted to doing a lot more of just like physical, preventative physical therapy on my upper body and shoulders and, you know, some, a lot of dry needling and cupping. Um, but, um, but I have, I have done yoga, but just not as frequently as I probably should be. <laughs> I like the fact that you can't keep quiet. <laughs> I cannot. That is a weakness of mine. It's not a weakness. <laughs> um, so since this is a cycling focused blog, I have to ask, what kind of watts do you push on the hand cycle? Watts? Watts, yeah. Um, so yeah, so my FTP is 115, um, but I will tell you there are a lot of other hand cyclists, um, men and women that are just also crushing it out there. And um, especially this last year with everyone spending a lot of time on Zwift, it's been really exciting and really fun to be able to see all these hand cyclists out there pushing each other. Um, because, you know, I think prior to, COVID hitting and people not being on Zwift as much, like people weren't as familiar with other people's like watts and numbers. And it's just so exciting to see like everyone pushing their limit and pushing each other. And um, at the end of the day, this is how the sport's going to grow and um, how we're going to get some really amazing athletes out of it. So um, I love a good FTP test. <laughs> oh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I tell myself I do though. Oh, okay. <laughs> you lie to yourself. Okay. Yeah. We got that. 
<laughs> so triathlons have taken you all over the world. Um, traveling for any triathlete is crazy with all the gear that you have to bring with. What's on your equipment list? Everything under the sun. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> when I... It's, it's, been, it's been interesting because, you know, when I first started about 10 years ago, really starting to travel for um, triathlon, I was, I was way overpacking. But I learned very quickly that going through the airport with two bikes, a wheelchair, and then suitcases and wheel bags is like just not the easiest thing. So you don't want to be overpacking any more than you need to. So, um, you know, for me, it's Obviously, my racing chair, my hand cycle, my wetsuit, cap, goggles. Um, both of my racing chair and my hand cycle are three-wheeled bikes. Um, so I have, you know, training wheels that I pack, um, but then I also pack my race wheels. So that's three, six, nine, twelve wheels that are coming with me um, in wheel bags, um, and then you know, extra tubes, and I bring a pump and a stationary trainer with me when we're going because. Um, you know, depending on where the race is, they're not, the road might not be the safest. Um, so we'll do, we'll set up our, in, our stationary trainer um, in like the hotels just to be able to get some, get our arms moving. Um, let's see, duct tape fly? is like my, my best friend because we put our numbers on our hand cycles and racing chair with like duct tape. So everyone knows if they need duct tape from me, it's going to be pink sparkly because I'm superstitious. I will say that and have only packed pink sparkly duct tape for the last 10 years when I go to races. I didn't even know um, they made that. <laughs> they do. And if you need to know where you can find it, let me know. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of equipment, but I think I, I, I mean, I have it down packed at this point. Do you fly with your gear or do you ship it out ahead of time? I fly. So I like to keep it nice and close to me as much as possible. Um, so I fly with it. Okay. That, that's a lot to go through the airport. I'm yeah, impressed. it is. When I was flying frequently before this last year, I made really good friends at Midway. The Midway <laughs> staff, were, they were amazing because when they, I came in, they were ready to help me um, get my bags, you know, That's, checked and to through as safely as possible. So That's super. So in a triathlon, uh, transition times can make or break a race when you're going for the podium position. Um, what's your best transition time? And is this something that you practice? Yes. So um, for para-athletes and specifically for para-athletes that are in wheelchairs, um, we're allowed one person in the transition area to help us. So that person, um, you know, can help us get our wetsuit off. That person can help strap our feet in on our hand cycle. That person can help lift us from our hand cycle to our racing chair. Um, so that person for me has always been my dad, the, or 99% of the time has been my dad for the last uh, 10 years. And it's been really fun because he's been able to travel the world with me. Um, and, you know, after, you know, over probably 100 races at this point, we have it very down pat and very quick. Um, and I always tell him, like, if I'm very mean during it, it's not, it's not him. It's just that we're in the zone. Um, so, you know, we have our both transitions down to just under a minute, which wow. I'm really proud of because they started at like closer to three minutes. Um, but Even three yeah, minutes I mean, is good. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, a lot of our races have come down to transition, you know, all you know, six or seven girls are coming into the transition area off the bike at the same time. And you want, I mean, every second counts. And so you want to be one of the first out of transition onto the run. So, um, you know, for me, I learned how I set up transition really impacts me. So, you know, I make sure my helmet's in a specific area. My sunglasses are on my helmet. Um, all the buckles and straps that I have on my hand cycle and on my racing chair are already undone. Mm -hmm. um, so all I have to do is slide in there and tighten them. So, um, you definitely learn through experience and trial and error. And um, I think the longer I've been in the sport and the more people I've been able to, you know, get advice from, you definitely lean on other athletes and ask them uh, what works best for them and, you know, figure out if you can apply it to your transition routine or not. But, um, you know, I think now it's been fun to help share what I've learned with this next generation of athletes. And, um, you know, that's what I'm excited about. And this next chapter for me is really giving back to a sport in a community that has given me so much. 
That's great. So with such drive, self-confidence, and you definitely have a can-do attitude, is it safe to assume you had like supportive parents? I mean, you talked about your dad being in the transition area. Um, what did your parents do or not do to help you become the person you are today? Yeah, I love that question that you asked that what the can they do and what didn't they do to help me become that because I think it's actually a mixture of both. So, um, you know, my parents are amazing. My family's amazing. Um, and I'm so lucky to have them in my life. But, you know, from five and a half months old, when, you know, doctors told my parents I was never going to live a normal life and um, I was going to be, I was never going to be independent. Like they were determined to prove them wrong and they were determined that I was going to live a life that was going to be valuable and was going to be able to, you know, do whatever I wanted to. And, you know, I think that was how they led, how they, up, how they raised me. And, um, you know, they didn't treat me any differently. I had two older brothers and many, many cousins. And, you know, like they let me go out there and do everything that they were doing. I mean, sure, I had to do it a little differently, but, um, you know, they were willing to help me figure out a way to adapt. And, um, you know, they, put me in school and I was the only one with a physical disability in the school, both grade school, kindergarten, preschool, high school. And for me, that taught me how to advocate for myself. Um, and it taught me, you know, how important it is to speak up when I do need help. But I think the other thing that they didn't do is they didn't baby me and they didn't do everything for me. And, you know, I always say the greatest gift that they gave me was my independence and that independence that they gave me is the independence that has allowed me to do everything I've been able to do um, today. So, um, you know, I'm so proud of them, to have them as my parents. And, you know, I think they've really set an example for other parents who are raising, you know, children who have disabilities because, you know, you don't walk out of a hospital with a guidebook of how to raise a child with a disability. And, um, you know, other parents are relying on, you know, parents who've been in a similar situation. And, um, you know, my parents have been able to be those people for other people, just like they had, you know, people to look up to when they were, when I was young. So um, yeah, they're, they're amazing people. So I think you probably pretty much answered this question already. So, you know, like what message would you like to tell parents of a disabled child or, directly to a disabled child, you know, and I think independence and, and not doing everything for them, I think. And I think it's really for able body or disabled. Absolutely. I think, you know, independence is the greatest thing that you can give your child, whether, like you said, like whether they have a disability or not, because you want your child to believe that they can do anything that they want to do and they can, um, you know, dream as big as they want. And I think the biggest thing with that is there's going to be a lot of hard work that comes behind that. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of successes and failures that come behind that, but that's okay because that's what makes us all human. And I think, um, you know, independence and um, is a piece of advice. And then, you know, I think for me, it's like kind of a, you know, I say independence, 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 but I think as I grew older, I realized, you know, I became really stubborn because I wanted to do everything myself. Um, and the situations I probably should have asked for help, like trying to reach something at the top shelf at the grocery store, like probably put me in a pretty bad situation. So like also learning that it is okay to ask for help and it's not going to make people think you're weak or that you can't do something and that everyone needs help in the world again, whether they have a disability or they don't. And so, um, you know, I think it's a double-ended sword there, of, you know, be independent and use your voice and advocate for yourself. But at the end of the day, like it is okay when you do need help. That's great advice. So we met through Dare to Try. We kind of talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, and they got you into triathlons. Tell me a little bit about your involvement with the organization now. Yeah, so I um, I feel like I've known Carrie Sirota, who's the executive director at Dare to Try my entire life, but I haven't. Um, so I met Carrie before Dare to Try was even, Dare to Try, before he was even, even established. And, you know, I remember her running this idea through me and um, getting my ideas. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, we need to do this. Um, and so, you know, her, Dan and Melissa went off and started Dare to Try. And um, 
I remember sitting at like the first athlete meeting and there was only maybe five or six of us um, and what they've been able to establish over the last 11 years now has been truly amazing and the community that they've developed not only in the Chicagoland area but around the United States and even globally is just remarkable for just three people and you know again I'm so proud to be part of that organization and for me um, it's not necessarily being an athlete within that organization, but it's the opportunity to volunteer at their events and, you know, meet these kids at kids camp and, um, you know, work with these injured um, veterans and be able to show them that through sport, they can find what their new normal is. And I'm a firm believer that there's not there's no such thing as normal, um, but you know, when you're an adult and you sustain a life altering injury, like you knew what life was like before you were an athlete and to show them that they can still be an athlete right. just in a different way is um, a really just enlightening experience to watch it from like the other side and watch their, them realize what they can do and, you know, be able to show their kids what they can do. And I think the same applies to like kids who, have grown up with a disability. Like for me, when I got involved in sport, like the confidence that I gained, not only from being an athlete, but then just like interacting with, with friends was so integral. It was a, such an important like chapter of my life because that confidence again has been able to allow me to do so many things. So working with these kids and showing them like, while we might be at a kid's triathlon camp, like the confidence that they learn through there is going to be able to be applied in so many different ways, yes. whether they want to be a musician or they want to be a, you know, a great math student or whatever it is like that confidence that we're teaching them and we're showing them um, is going to carry them through the, the rest of the rest oh, of their so life. So, um, you know, dare to try is getting athletes across the finish line, but they're teaching them skills and introducing, you know, introducing them to a community that's going to be with them forever. Oh, definitely. I, I've, I've changed just knowing the organization and being part of the organization. Yes. So you are only 25 years old. <laughs> You're young. Um, what's next for you? You've done so much already. <sighs> that has been the question I feel like of the last couple of months, you know, for me, um, triathlon and sport is always going to be part of my life. And, you know, I'm coming up with these endurance ideas of like, you know, I want to do a hundred mile race, run race, you know, I want to do probably do another Ironman. But for me right now, I think I'm taking the time to figure out how can I give back to a sport that has given me so much. And so I'm excited to be able to have, you know, while continuing to race and, you know, chase my own finish lines, I'm excited to also now have a little more time to, like I said, give back and, you know, volunteer and maybe get into some coaching um, but also I think I'm a firm believer, like inclusion and awareness begins with education. And so, um, have been able to do a lot of speaking for at different school events and, you know, allowing kids to ask those questions that they don't have an environment to ask them. And, you know, I get questions all the way from like, do you sleep in your wheelchair at night to like, how do you get on an airplane? And like, while those questions may seem very like superficial, I think those questions are so valuable because now they're going to know how someone who gets around a little differently does the same things as them. And I think that knowledge is going to take them with them the rest of their life. And so, um, you know, having time to speak a little more, um, and then I'm working on just two little, I keep, I keep calling them passion projects, but, um, I'm in the middle of writing a children's book, um, because, you know, I think representation is important. When I was, you know, a five-year-old girl in my purple sparkly wheelchair, like I wanted to see someone like me in, um, in the library or on like the school bookshelf. And um, so that is, that's in the works. And then also looking at doing some sort of documentary on like the power of people, because, you know, I, I look back on the last 25 years and I know I didn't get to where I am by myself. Um, and so I got there through the medical staff that worked with me. I got there through coaches. I got there through friends. I got there through family. 
And I think so often we meet people, but we don't realize the impact they have on us until after the fact. Um, but I think for me, I want to somehow figure out a, a way, and I am in the middle of figuring out a way of how to pers like portray this in a documentary type way. Um, so that's cause some other things I'm working on, but um, you know, I work full time and I love that. I think it makes me a, a well-rounded athlete and a well-rounded well employee because I think, you know, things I've learned through sport, I'm able to apply in the work setting and I think vice versa. So true. So, um, so yeah. Those are great passion projects. <laughs> I look forward to seeing that, uh, both the, the documentary and the children's book. So, well, Mary Kate, I really appreciate your time today. If someone wants to get in touch with you for a speaking engagement or with a question, um, should they just go to your website or is there another way to reach you? They can go to my website. Um, I'm also very active on social media. So um, Instagram is mk.callahan, C-A-L-L-A-H-A-N. Um, and or email me. My email is on my Instagram. So um, I love getting questions and I, I like to say I'm an open book. So there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, thank you very much. So thanks for watching another Sunflowers and Petals video. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button below and make sure to subscribe and enjoy the ride.